Good day again. Blessings to you. We're going to now conclude on the Vanity Fair series with chapter 4. Before we do so once again, let's just invite the Lord here. Father, as a people, we really want to come into conformity with your will because you deserve our obedience. You deserve our worship. You deserve everything that is good and as much as we can offer you because we can never offer you enough. But at least, Father, we can continue in our journey to know you more by offering you our outer life, our garments, our jewels, our everything. And so we pray that you might bless us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Things are not always as they seem. So we want to look at the stocking. The stocking. You remember I told you it was on deep fear from your head to your toe. So here we have some stockings there. And I want to tell you these particular stockings were known as prostitute stockings. So if any of you have ever watched, I guess, the movie like Pretty Woman. And you remember Julia Roberts, she had on those long stockings. Or maybe you pass a road where there are prostitutes. I don't know where you live. But you'll notice that prostitutes will wear a certain type of stocking and then a really, really short clothing. And part of that is because the stocking has a, it gives a, a, it gives an idea that the legs are longer and hence somehow more sexual in the mind of a man. And so you want to be careful with what kind of stockings you have on. <laughs> in cold weather, they should wear warm flannel or cotton drawers, which can be placed inside the stockings. This is just the way. Over these should be warm lined pants. Their dress should reach below the knee. So keep that in mind too. Your dress should always reach below your knee. Not just while standing, but while sitting. So that's easy to remember. And again, would it be more ideal for it to be longer? Yes. Would it be sin though? If it reaches below your knee, no, you're okay. So you want to keep that in mind because we're in different stages of Christianity. And so we want to do the best that we can. But in the least best that we can, we want to make sure that we're not tempting our brethren. And brothers have a really hard time when girls start showing out their legs. Because legs are, in the minds of men, it runs towards a point. And so we want to keep that in mind so that we keep our brothers, you know, focused on the right, on the right kind of thing. Shoes, we're down to shoes. So this is fascinating if you're looking at the, the slide here. So shoes, high heel shoes, pointed tip shoes. Now, first of all, I want to tell you that we should not, nobody ever, men or women should be wearing pointed tip shoes. I know that it can appear more formal, it can appear more kind of uh, dressed, but pointed tip shoes pushes all your toes together and it will cause problems, not only bunions, but it'll cause balance problems and it'll end up causing a lot of trouble as you get older. So God designed our feet and our toes to be spread out flat. That gives us the best support. So whatever uh, kind of shoe you're wearing. You want to make sure that your toes have space and uh, wiggle room. Now notice that the, the person that had the most shoes was Louis the 14th of France. <laughs> and you see him there and you see him have on those fantastic um, red and uh, was that red and gold. <laughs> That's fascinating. So high heel shoes was not just a woman thing. High heel shoe was a, a men thing in the history of shoes, which I just think it's fascinating. And there's, like I said, there's a lot I'm not telling you that in my research I found that for me was just, it was fascinating. And so here in this slide, I'm showing you a male high heel shoe. So that one there would be a male high heel shoe. And then I'm showing you the other high heel shoes that women have on, that women have on. And I want to tell you that high heel shoes do several things. One, they're not comfortable. And most women, as soon as they get home, will take them off and put on flats. 
But for some reason, I don't know, we decided that we want to put ourselves through some little torture in order so that we, I don't know, add a few inches. And adding inches is very important. I saw a whole documentary with Chinese men and women who were short that were going through knee surgery where they put in steel, uh, steel rods to give them two or three extra inches. And it would take them about four months to recover after the surgery. So people are willing to go to all lengths for vanity. But please, high heels do something else though. It puts us in the coptus position. So what it does, it lifts the woman onto her toes, hence pushing out her tush, her backside, her gluteus maximus, and uh, hence making her more, uh, giving her more attractive look, more like the look of the, of the goddess man come come. And so we want to stay away from the man come come look, <laughs> definitely. It also will end up giving you problems with your knees because it's throwing your entire skeletal structure off balance. God did not design us to be on our toes for so long a time. It's just not normal. Sister White, fashion rules the world, and she is a tyrannical mistress, often compelling her devotees to submit to the greatest inconvenience and discomfort. Fashion taxes without reason and collects without mercy. She has a fascinating power and stands ready to criticize and ridicule all who do not follow in her wake. Now, have I been ridiculed and criticized for the way uh, that I dress? Well, sometimes. I remember uh, back in church, folks started calling me Ellen White. Well, it's... It's very hard to criticize me because when they said you look like Ellen White, I thought that was a compliment. <laughs> if I'm looking like a prophet, that might be something good, right? Because I know that Ellen White is going to heaven. So if I'm looking like her, good on me, right? But uh, will people think you're a little peculiar and weird? Yeah. Are Christians peculiar and weird? Yeah. Does Jesus say that? Yeah. He said that you're a holy priesthood. Ah. Uh, Peculiar people. He uses the word. So if the world agrees with God and thinks you're peculiar, you, know, you must be doing something right. At least that's what I think I'm going to write. So here we go in androgyny in this. The slides really get interesting. So here we have a whole bunch of celebrities. And they all have these bald-headed cuts. What's going on with this? Why is everybody having these kinds of cuts? Well, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes a whole long um, letter saying that the women ought not to have bald heads, but they are to have hair, for their hair is given to them as their covering. Why? Well, the women were actually balding their heads because this was actually part of the priestess worship in the time of the Romans, in the time of the Greeks, in the time of Egyptians, in the time of Babylonians. Priestesses, it's actually quite common for them to bald their heads, especially during certain ritual times. And so, because Hollywood and the people that are in them are so connected with the occult, they have started balding their heads. And because we are so connected with Hollywood, we started balding our heads, which is a problem. Because a woman with a bald head, if you look at a woman with a bald head and a man with a bald head, and the both of them are walking down the street, then you would have a very hard time identifying which is which. So we want to stay away from these kinds of uh, indistinctive dress ideas. Here is this one. If women can wear pants, then men can wear I don't even know what that is, but that's the Vogue runway. That's Vogue, that's the runway, and I don't even know what the men are wearing, but they're wearing something. <laughs> Sister White says, taste should be manifested as the colors. Uniformity in this respect is desirable as far as convenient. Complexion, however, may be taken into account. Modest colors should be sought for when figured material is used, figures that are large and fiery, showing vanity and shallow pride in those who choose them should be avoided, and a fantastic taste in putting on different colors is bad. So we don't want to look like the rainbow all at once. That's a lot. 
We want to take into account our complexion. We want to wear things that will be appropriate and modest. We don't want to wear things with these big flashy things. So some women have sexy. We don't want that on our t-shirts. But we also don't want things like the men, women beaters or, you know, people wearing all sorts of craziness today. We want to make sure that whatever is written or whatever object is on there, that it's appropriate and that it's proper. A good way to do this is to go after you dress in front of the mirror and just ask the Lord, Father, are you happy with how I'm dressed? Is how I'm dressed giving glory to you? And if you can answer that with a yes, with a clear conscience, then you're probably okay. <clears throat> well, who wears the pants in their house? Well, I don't know. Because here we have both men and women dressed almost the exact same way. And on the other side, we have men and they're wearing flowers, which is fascinating. The outside appearance is frequently an index to the mind. And we should be careful what signs we hang out for the world to judge of our fate. So we are walking signposts. And what is the world reading when it sees us? Is it reading prostitute? Is it reading not connected with God? Is it reading fanatic extremist? Is it reading balance? Kind of cute. I like it. That's the one we wanted to read. <laughs> We want to be appropriate, but modest. We want to be ladylike, gentlemanly-like. Old-fashioned is fine. I like those old-fashioned words. And most people do. They might try to deny it because it's not trending now. But by the way, modesty is right now coming back into fashion. But it should always be in fashion for the Christian. Well, men and women look the same. If you look at the pictures there, is this cool or wrong? Look how similar they look. You couldn't identify these people. If they were walking away from you, you couldn't know which one was the man or which one was the woman. This is a problem. Because of the distinctions between men and women in terms of how they appear has become so muddled, the minds of men and women have become muddled. And it has led to some of the... Uh, wrong sexual practices of the day because confusion always results in confusion <clears throat> so this is even more fascinating so my question here is which washroom do they use the one with the skirt on it or the one with the pants on it because here we have two men and they're both wearing skirts and they're not wearing skirts because they're scottish they're wearing skirts because they're wearing skirts. They're not necessarily wearing skirts because they're gay. They're wearing skirts because men have come to the understanding that if women can wear whatever they want, we can wear whatever we want. Like I told you, confusion simply breeds more confusion. Ministers. So now we're going to get a little bit more serious. Sister White. The loss of some souls at last will be traced to the untidiness of the minister. Sometimes I have to pause when I read these things Sister White says. It's like, what? <laughs> the loss of some souls at last will be traced to the untidiness of the minister. The first appearance affected the people unfavorably because they could not in any way link his appearance with the truths he presented. His dress was against him. And the impression given was that the people whom he represented were a careless set who cared nothing about their dress, and his hearers did not want anything to do with such a class of people. So when you dress, you don't want to be untidy. You don't want to be dirty. No. You want to be clean, appropriate, modest, becoming, for the occasion too. So if you're going to a gathering, a festive gathering, don't go like if you're going to a funeral. That's just strange. And that's you being strange on purpose. You don't want to be strange on purpose. What dress ought to be? I beg of our people to walk carefully and circumspectly before God, having the dress of good, durable material, appropriate for the age. They should shun extremes, dress neatly and becomingly. There is a class who are continually harping upon pride and dress 
who are careless of their own apparel and who think it a virtue to be dirty and dress without order and taste. And their clothing often look as if it flew and lit upon their persons. They sometimes consider oddity and coarseness humility. All kinds of strange people in the world. God wants his people to be balanced. He wants his people to look as if they're reasoning from cause to effect, as if they know why they wear what they wear. Our appearance in every respect should be characterized by neatness, modesty, and purity. Some protests that we hear. What's wrong with my wearing slits? Everyone is wearing it. I don't see the sense in what you're suggesting. Why don't you look somewhere else if it bothers you? You just have an evil mind. It's my body. It's my choice. Nobody's going to tell me how to dress. The pastor's wife has on one just like what I have on. What you wear will not take you to heaven or to hell, so it doesn't matter. We are living in a modern world. People will think I'm weird if I dress the way you're telling me. Only old people dress like that. If I dress like that, I'll never get a man. That kind of clothing is very uncomfortable. Well, it's not the first time that God has dealt with protests. And if you look at the texts that are on the screen there, you'll find that God has always been dealing with excuses, protests, but when God brings light, we want to say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Because God has given you all of heaven. And what he asks from us is very small. I don't know about you, but I'm going to offer him all of me. And I hope you will too. And forget the protests. <laughs> is dress reform really that important? This is my final slide. Fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. What? Like I always this is she like gives you these statements that you have to like turn back again. Fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedience to fashion is pervading our seven day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power. Fashion is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. I have been shown that our church rules are very deficient. All exhibitions of pride in dress, which is forbidden in the word of God, should be sufficient reason for church discipline. What? Did she just say that? Yes, how you dress should be sufficient reason for church discipline. If there is continuance in face of warnings and appeals and entreaties to still follow the perverse will, it may be regarded as a proof that the heart is in no way assimilated to Christ. Self and only self is the object of adoration and one such professed Christian will lead many away from God. There is a terrible sin upon us as a people that we have permitted our church members to dress in a manner inconsistent with our faith. We must arise at once and close the door against the allurements of fashion. Unless we do this, our churches will be demoralized. I believe this statement has already reached fulfillment. Our churches are already demoralized and fashion has separated us from our God. But I'm appealing to you today because God is very near. And if we seek him, we shall find him if we search for him with our whole hearts. He wants to be found of us. He wants us to dress with his righteous garment so that when our friends and our family see us, they must be saying, that young lady is dressing in a very different way. Huh? That young man, but he's pulled up his pants up. He's really looking like if he's ready to take on the responsibilities of the world. 
That yeah, you, you know what I've had happen to me by the way I dress? Strange men open doors. <laughs> They'll go out of their way to make sure that I am treated in a way that they used to treat women back in the day. Simply because of how I dress. Because how you dress tells a man of your worth. And he will treat you as you think you're worth. <laughs> like, I see my word in the cross. And like I told you, if, if I'm worth the life of God, I must be worth a lot. <laughs> and not only me, but you and all of us. So let us give our hearts and our outer garments to the Lord. And allow him to mold and fashion us upon his will. May the Lord bless you.